I'm Dennis Anderson, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. It has been a momentous week in our nation's history. Congressman Pete Stauber joins us live tonight to talk about events this week at the U.S. Capitol. UMD Chancellor Lendley Black is here, too, with an update on how COVID will affect the start of the spring semester next week. And local economic experts talk about the impact of the pandemic, and they share their outlook for local businesses. These stories and the voices of the region coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome once again to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Dennis Anderson. Julie is off this week as we alternate hosting the program during the pandemic. Our show was broadcast live Friday at 5.30 p.m. Much of the nation watched in shock on Wednesday as the Capitol in Washington, D.C. was stormed by a crowd that had been rallying in support of President Trump. The demonstrators had gathered in protest of Congress, certifying the victory of President-elect Joe Biden. Well, the crowd marched to the Capitol building and many breached Capitol security, smashing windows and rushing into the building. It was a chaotic scene and members of Congress were rushed from the House and Senate chambers to safety. Minnesota 8th District Representative Pete Stauber is here now to talk about the riot there in the Capitol building and its aftermath. Welcome. Glad to see you're safe. Uh, thanks, Dennis. It's great to be with you t here tonight. Thank you very kindly. What did you see when you first realized, uh, Congressman, that there was a problem going on, a breach of security? Well, Dennis, what uh, my part was uh, I went to the House floor to watch the historic counting of the electoral votes. And uh, the third state, uh, Arizona, was uh, challenged. Uh, uh, a, a member of the House and a member of the Senate challenged it. So that means there's a debate uh, in one hour in the Senate and one hour in the House. And I had some legislative stuff to do uh, with my chief of staff in the office. So I actually left the House floor and was walking back through the tunnels. And it was at that time where my pagers went off and the phones went off. And my chief of staff said uh, there's issues with uh, uh, the Capitol uh, being breached and mm -hmm. also Cannon House office building. So uh, we're trained to go to certain spots. Sure. And, and uh, I went to uh, a location that was secure and safe. Your reaction to what happened on Wednesday? You know, um, watching what happened in our nation's capital was just uh, uh, was uh, horrific to, to see the beacon of freedom uh, uh, with the protesters coming through, um, you know, storming the Capitol. And, and I've said this, you know, uh, mob rule uh, uh, is, is not what this country's about. Mm -hmm. uh, we, mob doesn't rule the city of Minneapolis or St. Paul or Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, or New York City or our nation's capital, simply unacceptable. You've been a staunch supporter of President Trump, but uh, things change now this week and you've been critical of him. Why? Well, well one of the things that uh, uh, concerns me, I'm disappointed in, in some of the things he said, and, and I'm disappointed uh, that, uh, that uh, there were some challenges on, on Vice President Pence's uh, uh, character. Uh, Vice President Pence this week rose to the moment in political prominence by accepting uh, the electoral votes that were uh, sent by all 50 of the states. He followed the Constitution, and I'm very, very happy, and we should all be very happy that Vice President F uh, Pence followed the Constitution mm -hmm. as he swore the oath to. Many of your Democratic colleagues are uh, calling for impeachment or use of the 25th Amendment. Would you support impeachment or use of the 25th? Well, I think the 25th Amendment has to do with working with the cabinet side. And, and I think that uh, impeachment at this moment is going to divide uh, an already uh, divided nation. And I want to be, Dennis, I want to be part of the healing. And I'm looking forward to working in the 117th Congress. And uh, uh, I will be in attendance uh, uh -huh. at the inauguration on January 20th. The president says he won't be at the inauguration. What do you think of that? Well, I just found out about that uh, late this afternoon, and and uh, you know, I'm it's his choice. And uh, there's been there have been a couple other presidents uh, that haven't attended for other reasons. So I just think that the peaceful transfer of power is what sets our nation apart from any other nation in the world. 
And uh, I was at the inauguration uh, for uh, uh, President Trump uh, when uh, uh, Pre President Obama and, and Michelle Obama were there mm -hmm. to watch that peaceful transfer of power. That is, a, that is part of the beacon of freedom. That's part of our Constitution. And it's very concerning because we want, uh, we want to be the leader of the free world. And I think that that transfer of power is so, so crucial and so critical on, on who we are peacefully. Do you think the president did enough on Wednesday night to stop the attack? You know, uh, I think that uh, the rhetoric and some of the words used disappointing. And uh, I, I just uh, think that, that we can do better as a nation. And I want to do my part as being uh, uh, better. Mm -hmm. We have to watch our words, watch our rhetoric. What do we say on our Facebook and our Twitter? And it seems like this time, place, the intensity, uh, somebody tries to get a political advantage by posting something on Facebook or saying something. And I want to just do the people's business. And, and in the 117th Congress, we have so many opportunities to help not only our constituents, yeah. uh, Dennis, but the nation move forward. You announced prior to the Capitol attack that you are going to vote to certify the electoral votes, uh, even though you had previously supported a, a Texas lawsuit calling some, some states the election results uh, into question. How did you come to that decision? Well, let's go back to on the amicus brief is what you were talking about. If you, re if you read the amicus brief, it was to say follow the Constitution and look at ma to make sure all states, their federal election law, followed the Constitution. That's what the amicus brief was. And uh, so when I uh, voted to accept the electoral votes, that's what the Constitution demands of us. Congress is not the decider of the election. Yeah. We still have the Electoral College, and the Electoral College has been good for this country for a long time because it helps rural America have a voice. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be having California, Texas, Florida, Michigan, and New York deciding our elections. Our 10 electoral votes should matter, Dennis. The president on Thursday said after the riot that there's going to be a peaceful transfer of power to the new president. Uh, your thoughts? Well, uh, that's exactly what should happen, a peaceful transfer of power, and uh, that's going to happen on uh, January 20th. Do you think those words ring hollow? You know, I think that some people might say they, they, they ring hollow, but I will tell you this, that, that I'm looking forward to working in the 117th Congress and working on both sides of the aisle, yeah. and never should we allow uh, a mob to rule or riots or looting any more in this nation. Our, our police officers deserve the respect. The Constitution matters and, and citizen safety is, uh, is of primary importance. Sure. Congressman Pete Stauber, I wish we had a lot more time. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. Happy New Year, Dennis. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. Well, we invited the Minnesota Senators to join us, but we did not hear back from them by showtime. Turning to other news of the week, Governor Tim Walz has loosened restrictions on bars, restaurants, and other entertainment venues in Minnesota as COVID cases in the state trend down. Starting Monday, bars and restaurants can resume indoor service at 50% capacity with a cap of 150 people. Other indoor facilities like movie theaters, bowling alleys, and museums can open at 25% capacity. Well, the St. Louis County Board this week selected Iron Range Commissioner Mike Jugovich to serve as chair for the second consecutive year. It is the first time in nearly 100 years that the same commissioner was elected chair of the board. Now, typically, the chair rotates between northern and southern district commissioners but Djokovic said nothing has been ordinary during the pandemic. The University of Wisconsin-Superior has received a $100,000 gift to help purchase a new floating classroom. The challenge gift from UWS alumni Bill and Lynn Rogers will help the university replace the L.L. Smith research vessel. The Lake Superior Research Institute will operate the vessel and is a two-year planning phase for the new floating classroom. 
University of Minnesota Duluth students return to campus already next week for the start of the spring semester. But it's not going to be business as usual as the COVID pandemic continues to alter the routine for students and staff. And so joining us to talk about the spring plan is Lenley Black. He's the chancellor of UMD. Dr. Black, Black, thank you very much uh, for being here. I know we've uh, uh, just recently received a, a statement that you have issued uh, on the attack on the Capitol. Uh, why did you write the statement? Well, Dennis, I, I think like many other people, I was uh, shocked, uh, disappointed, and, and really frightened to a certain extent as I watched what was unfolding uh, at, our, at our nation's capital. And I just, I just felt like it was important to make my feelings known and to reinforce to our campus community our core values at UMD, focusing on integrity, focusing on respecting diverse opinions and diverse people, and disagreeing in productive ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does that statement then fit into UMD's uh, overall statement of, uh, of excellence? Well, as, as I mentioned, it's a it, statement. yes, uh, it, it's also reflected in our mission statement that our students are being educated and prepared to be engaged citizens, uh, global citizens, citizens of the world. And so I wanted to reinforce that notion that we, we still need to be focused on uh, helping people become engaged, involved in civic activities, but doing it in a way that's productive, that's safe, uh, that uh, challenges, but in a way that is lawful and respects diversity of opinion. We are now 10 months into the pandemic, uh, Dr. Black. Uh, how has the pandemic affected UMD students and staff? Well, it's been a uh, challenging 10 months. There's no, there's no way to uh, sugarcoat it or, or to doubt that at all. Uh, but I'm extremely pleased at the way our faculty, staff, and students have risen to the occasion. Uh, we had a, overall a very successful fall semester. Uh, we never had a big surge in COVID cases. Uh, we ended up with about 81 students who tested positive through our health services on campus here and about 600 total faculty, staff and students who were positive. Mm -hmm. So those numbers were, were very much within what we would have expected. Um, our people have been abiding well by uh, the requirements of wearing masks, of keeping physical distances, of, of using hand sanitizers, et cetera. So yeah. I, I think we, we've had a very successful fall. The spring session begins now Wednesday on the 13th of January. Are you making any changes from the fall session? Uh, not many at all, because as I said, we were successful. We did get through Thanksgiving without having to send our students home, which was our primary focus and goal. So in the, in the spring, we'll continue with a, a variety of course uh, modalities. About 53% of our students will have either total face-to-face -face classes or blended classes that are face-to-face -face mm -hmm. and partly online, and the rest will be totally online. Is student registration done? Uh, we'll, we're not sure about what it is for the spring. Uh, we typically have a small decrease every year between fall and spring, but it's too early uh, to tell wh where we're going to end yeah. up this spring. How are you protecting students on campus? Well, we are um, being very diligent in keeping the campus uh, sanitized. Uh, we have um, added uh, hand sanitizing stations throughout the campus. We, we clean campuses in between class periods to make sure uh, that they are what they should be in, ter in terms of uh, free of, of germs or, or, or COVID. Uh, we are also uh, requiring masks still on campus and our, our campus community has been incredibly good mm -hmm. about um, abiding by, by that. Um, and uh, we just have an overall approach Dr. Lenley Black, time on the air goes quickly. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Dennis. Appreciate nice it very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. The beginning of the Minnesota legislative session headlines this week, Voices of the Region. Now, each week we hear from a journalist in our broadcast area and the stories they're reporting. Northern Minnesota author and columnist Aaron Brown begins with the new dynamic for Northern Minnesota lawmakers at the state capitol.
we've been talking for the last few years about the changes in political leanings of northeastern Minnesota, uh, a more conservative Iron Range, a much redder rural part of the northeast, and then, of course, the liberal blue city of Duluth. And uh, all of these things are kind of manifest here in the opening week of the session. Uh, first of all, in the state Senate, which is controlled by Republicans, you have an Iron Range state senator, uh, David Tomasoni, as the president pro tem, the president of the Senate, uh, who is a, was elected just last November as a Democrat, but uh, has become, I guess, an independent, you'd call it, since, and then joined with, with Senator Bach of Cook, uh, the Republican caucus. And, and he, uh, Tomasoni and pa Bach both got committee chairs in the Republican Senate. And Tomasoni has this largely ceremonial, but still high profile role in the proceedings of the Senate. So that's a very different place for Iron Range um, senators to be in. On the Republican side, um, you know, we're now getting Republican lawmakers in northeastern Minnesota who have been in office long enough to get some seniority. And you see Senator Justin Eichhorn in his second term uh, getting the chairmanship of the Mining uh, Natural Resources Committee in the Senate. So um, for losing clout, as northeastern Minnesota has done uh, in both economic and population terms, um, even though the, the mix is, is more of a swing region with less one party um, as it used to be, you're seeing uh, local lawmakers enjoying maybe the last time we see something like this where these local lawmakers are all in, in high positions of leadership within their own parties. Cliffs has always been an important company in the region for a very long time, but they, you know, it's like when checkers, when you reach the end and you king yourself, you know, they, they kinged themselves uh, this, this last year by um, acquiring the assets of ArcelorMittal USA, which is the American wing of the largest steelmaker on earth, which is ArcelorMittal. Uh, they acquired the American assets, which include a lot of steel mills and uh, some iron mining properties as well. And that makes Cleveland Cliffs, combined with the assets they already had, the largest producer of iron and steel in North America. Uh, in other words, the position that U.S. Steel had when it was the biggest corporation on earth 100 years ago, Cleveland Cliffs has now attained here in the 21st century. There's an ongoing investigation over what happened. A, a, a shoplifting suspect fled into the woods, was followed by a police dog and police officers, and outside the view of anyone else, a scuffle ensued, and uh, tasers were used on the suspect, uh, um, Esteban Ilioff, and uh, then guns were drawn and fired, and he was killed. Now, there's a lot more to that story. Obviously, we don't know all the details yet. Um, and so I don't mean to uh, have like divine knowledge of, of what's happened in this incident. But nevertheless, the fact remains that it was a shoplifting suspect who fled on foot, which is not terribly uh, unheard of, uh, who ended up dead. And, and that's, I think, uh, gets at this question of force in policing uh, that deserves our attention even here in northern Minnesota. It is so often conflated as just a metro issue because me metropolitan areas are bigger and the perception is that their crime rates are higher and there's a lot of cultural aspects of that question because of a higher population of minority people of color and uh, the different uh, history with policing that, that those communities have. But uh, I think it's the story I wanted to raise is the fact that this just highlights that there's something bigger here involving the, the interface between police and the community that's changed. Uh, it's changed with society, with changes in society, but it's changed in ways that may be getting out ahead of us and really for the benefit of police communities and and all people uh, we've got to figure out a way for situations like this not to end in death
It has been an Almanac North tradition now for more than 25 years to start the first show of a new year with a review of the past year's economy. Now, we normally invite three economic experts to the studio for a discussion of the business year. But like so many things, COVID and the need to physical distance in the studio has forced us to alter those plans. So joining us now in the studio is the longest tenured <laughs> member of our economic panel, yeah. Tony Barrett, St. Scholastica Professor Emeritus. Welcome back, Tony. And while your colleagues aren't physically here, we did speak with them earlier this week. And here's what they had to say about 2020 and 2021 and the year ahead. It came out of the blue and affected uh, everybody. And Wisconsin, Northwest Wisconsin is no different. And I can also say about actually the reef, Northeast Minnesota as well. And um, one can imagine, especially uh, the restaurant industry, hospitality sector, the leisure entertainment industry, um, they took the largest hit, you can say that, because of the uh, kind of services they provide. Uh, and also the service sector, you can imagine, um, because that uh, interaction is not happening, face-to-face -face interaction. It looks like a good year for steel coming up. There's probably going to be pent-up demand and and uh, a lot of people just anxious to go back to spending money and replacing things that are broken and, and uh, getting on with life. I think one thing that wasn't expected is key tech bouncing back so quickly and you know, it's it's kind of it's a smaller plant, and I I think there might have been some doubt about its future, but having that back up and running is is a great thing, and and uh, the rest of the mines too. It's I see lots of possibilities, and I think there are certain areas we can bounce back, and I already see uh, our um, you know with the vaccination if it is available and all in some uh, industry like especially our restaurant industry, hospitality industry, the tourism sector, which is our strength. They're already making plans. Uh, you know, if this happens, what we should do? What, how, what kind of a package we should offer to our customers? Uh, not only the locals here, but also the people who will come and visit us, especially during summer. Hopefully by that time, we get that vaccination thing. I think it will recover more in 2022 than 2021. It, the, the vaccine rollout hasn't moved very quickly and uh, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty one thing we learned this year from people we spoke to on the phone is that uh, as soon as a lot of people got their stimulus check, they hit the road and they started spending in the uh, tourist section or sector. But I, all that is gonna depend on government regulations and, and what's required to keep COVID under control. So Tony Barrett, retired economics professor at St. Scholastica joins us now. And I guess my first question, Tony, is what potential impact could the trouble at the U.S. Capitol on Wednesday have on the nation's economy? Could there be an effect? There could be, and it depends on whether the political environment changes in Washington. We need more stimulus. Uh, on the other hand, we have a lot of debt. So the issue to me is what strategy the Republicans follow. The Democrats are going to try and pro provide $2 trillion, probably more, of spending. But do the Republicans revert back to debt is bad, we have to reduce our debt, we have to control our spending? So the size of the stimulus, there will be stimulus. Mm -hmm. But whether it's going to be a trillion, half a trillion, or $2 trillion, We also have a severe political divide in this country. Could yes. that affect the economy? It is, yes. All right, right off the bat, we have the Biden administration wanting to get out a, what is a hundred vaccine, hundred million vaccines in the first hundred days, whatever. Does that become politicized? Do there become people who actively try to disrupt that process? Does, I mean, this whole pandemic became politicized mm -hmm. in a, to a degree that I never would have expected. Will that change? Will people now go, enough's enough, mm -hmm. now let's try and save a few hundred thousand lives? I mean. Roughly 400,000 Americans are going to be dead from this virus. Did the jobs report come out today? It came out what today. What did that show? 140,000 fewer jobs in December than in November. It was uh, definitely negative. We're 10 million fewer people working now than in February. That's 10 million wage earners not earning money, not spending money. 
It was very disappointing. We built this bridge. Remember the bridge in April and May? A great stimulus care packages, but it turned out the bridge didn't get to the other side. The bridge got us out there and now we're falling off and there hasn't been additional stimulus. We need something to get us to the summertime. 10 months into the pandemic, how has the pandemic affected the local economy, Tony? You know, right off the bat, we saw that with AAR. People weren't flying, airlines didn't need maintenance, they shut down a maintenance base and we lost a lot of jobs. Uh, and then tourism, it depended on where you were, how severely you were hit. But if you're in the hospitality business, yeah. you can't operate at 25%. So closed. can local businesses survive another, another shutdown? I think so, not another shutdown. And ho no one's, hopefully no one's talking about another complete shutdown. I think that turned out to be a bad strategy. We just need to make it to yeah. April or May, where the weather gets better, people start coming to visit us. Now, the local mining industry did spring back to life uh, after several months of downtime. Uh, what's the issue there now? Do you expect to see that again this year? I expect it to be a very good year. Car, car manufacturing's been strong, construction's been strong. Those are the industries that need new steel, and that's our, that's our taconite. What's your prediction for 2021? I think when we're talking this time next year, the pandemic will be a distant memory. And I think it won't have as much impact on businesses and in behavior as pundits are suggesting. Uh, I also think we'll start seeing the beginnings of higher interest rates. I expect the 10-year Treasury bill to be 10% and inflation. I expect that to be 1.5%, 2%. I need a quick answer. A year ago, we talked about consumer confidence. Are consumers still confident that they want to spend money? The people who have jobs are doing great. People who don't have jobs don't. It's a very have or have not economy. All right. Tony Barrett, thank you very much. Professor Emeritus, College of St. Scott. Happy New Year. Thank you. And that's our time for this week, but don't forget to follow us on social media. Remember, we're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit the WDSC website for updates on programming, news about the station, and upcoming events. And you can also download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of your favorite programs. Thanks to our guests and the crew here in the studio. I'm Dennis Anderson. Stay healthy, everyone, and be kind.